I got about six photographs here. And you may or may not know who's in these pictures, okay? And that's okay. And I, what I want you to do is look at them. And if you recognize any of them, you tell me. This guy here is the guy that you were with last night. Okay, he's the one that you were underneath the bridge with. This is 10-year-old Amber Daniels. Hours before this footage was recorded, Amber was found on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere with two other young girls. When police attempt to locate their parents, they learn that all three children are part of the Daniels family, a household known for fostering many kids. But when police arrive at the home, the front door is wide open. What they discover inside is one of the most disturbing home invasions the state of Georgia has ever seen. It will launch a statewide manhunt for the mass murderer known as the Santa Claus Killer. Must have had a hundred law enforcement officers and agencies coming in helping us search. This is the most agents I've seen. Ten-year-old Amber Daniels kidnapped, abused, along with her two younger sisters, but she survived, outsmarting her captor. She went on to solve her own case and made sure the man responsible would pay for what he took from her. It's 5 a.m. on December 4th, 1997. A farmer in Bacon County, Georgia, is working on his property when he spots three young girls walking along the side of the road. He goes over to them, asking if they are okay, when he notices they're barefoot with only pajamas on. One of the kids say they are from Santa Claus, Georgia, a small town 50 miles north. The man, realizing the children are far from home, quickly calls 911 and alerts them of the kids found alone near his property. The Bacon County Police arrive at the scene and take them back to the station, asking where they live and what happened. The 10-year-old, Amber, says they're sisters and part of the Daniels family and gives them her home address. Deputy Sheriff Mike Harlan is sent to the children's house to get any information he can. I expected anxious parents or at least a mother or somebody meeting me at the door. But when he arrives, everything is hauntingly quiet. As Deputy Harlan makes his way towards the home, he notices the front door is open. The officer loudly announces his presence, asking if anyone is home. No response. Upon entering, the sound of an alarm clock radio, a home security system beeping, and a baby crying immediately become louder. As Harlan walks further into the home, he sees something moving underneath the table. It's a little boy. Silent and in a state of shock, the boy quietly signals the police officer. He really didn't say much of anything. He kind of pointed toward the bedroom. There appeared to be blood on the frame of the bedroom door. Harlan very gently pushes the door open. When he enters the room, he discovers the body of a young woman, motionless on the floor. The police officer takes another step inside and notices two shapes on the bed. It doesn't take long for him to realize that two more bodies, an adult man and an adult woman, are lying underneath the sheets, not breathing. Next to them, he sees a baby crying. The deputy checks the rest of the house, discovering another horrifying scene in one of the kids' rooms. A little boy lays motionless in his bed, blood around him, dead. Not knowing there's still a shooter on site, I grabbed the baby up, grabbed the other little boy up in my arms, and we went back out to the door. Back in the police station in Bacon County, investigators ask the three little girls what happened to them. Amber, who is the oldest, starts to tell her story and reveals a name that will change everything. She tells them that she was taken from her bedroom earlier that night by a man named Scott. The year is 1995. Amber is eight years old and lives with her biological mother, Kim, who is a recovered alcoholic. Growing up, Amber and her siblings were routinely placed in foster homes as her mother was unable to take care of them. But throughout the years, Kim was determined to better her life and become sober to provide a loving, supportive home for her three children. While attending Alcoholics Anonymous, she meets another recovering alcoholic, Danny Daniels, and they fall in love and start a new sober life. They had quit drinking. They had changed everything about their lives. The day that child services let me return back home to my mother was probably one of the best days of my life. I ran to her arms, and there was a man just standing there, open arms, and welcomed me into his house and wanted to love me just as much as my mom. Danny and Kim got married, bringing together his teenage daughter, Jessica, and her three kids, Brooke, Bryant, and Amber, all under one roof. 
Kim's aspiration of providing a secure, loving, and supportive home for her children was becoming a reality. Just a few years before, it was her who needed assistance for her children. Now that Kim was sober with a stable home, she was eager to give back and open her doors to foster children, creating a nurturing environment of her own. Amber remembers from a young age how her family started to welcome foster children. It was so exciting to have kids to play with. One of the first foster children the Daniels welcomed was a young girl named Joanne. I just knew that she was going to be my best friend. She was the same age as I was. She was so nice. And One day, Jerry stops coming over. Two years go by, and his sister Joanne has gone back into her mom's care, leaving the Daniels behind, and neither Amber nor her family have heard from Jerry since then. It's now 1997. The Daniels have a full house, with three foster children added to their original four. As the holidays approach, they look forward to a festive time together as the family has already put up their Christmas tree. It's December 4th, only a few weeks before Christmas. Amber is sleeping peacefully like any other night, when suddenly, she's woken up. Even though she hasn't seen him in years, the little girl recognizes Jerry. And he's yelling at me to wake up, wake up, you've got to wake up. Amber is in shock. In the distance, she can hear her siblings crying from the other room. Jerry tells her they must leave the house immediately. I was frightened and scared, and hearing the girls crying, I didn't know what was going on. Jerry grabs a hold of Amber's arm and rushes her down the hallway. The little girl is very confused and asks him where her parents are. He tells her that her mom and dad are not in the house and that they've already left with the other children, and they've told him to get her and her two other young sisters, Amanda and Brooke. But just before they leave by the front door, Amber turns around and sees her four-year-old brother, Corey, hiding underneath the kitchen table. In the distance, she hears her baby brother Gabe crying. Why are we leaving them? Why are we leaving them? He said, your mom and dad's gonna come back and get him. Jerry was always good to us, so it felt okay to leave with him. They all get inside his van as he tells them he is taking them to their parents. But as he continues to drive down the deserted road, the girls become increasingly worried and begin to cry, not knowing where they are going or where their parents are. After driving for more than half an hour, the car slows down and turns onto a side street and then parks underneath a bridge. Jerry then proceeds to turn off the engine and tells Amber to get in the back with him as he makes Amanda and Brooke move to the front. And so now I'm, I'm getting a little more scared at this point because now I'm confused. What is going, what's going on? The man proceeds to remove his clothing. Amber notices a knife in his boot and a gun on the floor of the vehicle. He then forces himself on 10-year-old Amber. And so at this point I was crying and he told me if I didn't stop crying that he would do it to the other two. So I stopped crying because I didn't want him to hurt them. When Jerry finally stops, he orders Amber to put her clothes back on. The little girl obeys while her attacker gets out of the car and back behind the wheel. Without any words, Jerry starts to... My mind just said, this is your opportunity. You're out of that van. Run. We can hide in the woods. Just run as fast as you can. The three barefoot children start to run away from the van. Behind them, Jerry screams for them to stop and come back. Amber hears him chasing after them and she increases her pace. Her attacker is bigger than her and her two sisters, but Amber still hopes they can outrun him. But Jerry is coming closer and closer behind Brooke and violently grabs her arm, stopping her right in her tracks. And he told me if I didn't get back in the van, he was going to throw her over the bridge and I'd never see her again. Amber is forced to make an impossible choice, save herself and sacrifice the life of her younger sister or risk what will happen to her if she goes back in the van. Amber knows the only way to protect her younger sister and ensure she's safe is to follow Jerry's demands. Her and her sister, Amanda, begin to slowly walk back to Jerry and Brooke. Once they are together, Jerry orders them back in his van as he begins to drive them further away from their home. He turned down this road and so I asked him again, where are you taking us? What are we doing? He got agitated and started yelling, and then he pulled up in a little dead-end spot and put us out and told us that we were to wait there for five minutes until he came back. He kept saying, I'll be back in five minutes. I'll be back in five minutes. You better be here. They all stand silently, watching Jerry's car drive away. They dare not move until they no longer see the lights of his vehicle. After counting for 65 seconds, Amber tells her sisters to run. I told the girls that we've got to find help. We've got to tell them what's happened. We've got to find our parents. We've got to get back home. 
As they run along the road, they see a secluded farmhouse in the distance, but all of a sudden, car headlights beam right in front of their path. So I made the two girls jump down in the ditch to try to keep from being seen. And the car slowed down and I knew that we had just been caught. Our lives were over. Amber is petrified. A man emerges from the car, but it's not her attacker. Instead, a local f Amber knows who did this, and she wants to make sure he is captured and brought to justice. She tells officials the crucial piece of information, the name of the man responsible, Jerry Scott Heidler. He is the brother of one of the foster children and would come by to the Daniels family often, playing with the children and expressing unwanted romantic interest to the teenage daughter, Jessica. Police search for any information they have on Jerry and find he is already in the police records. Due to his prior arrest on a DUI charge, they have his mugshot in their file. Investigators then present Amber with a series of photographs, seeking confirmation of the man responsible for her abduction. I got about six photographs here, and you may or may not know who's in these pictures, okay? And that's okay, and I want you to look at them, and if you recognize any of them, you tell me. They just showed me a picture, is this the guy? I said, yes, this is, this is Scott Hattler. In order to build the case against Jerry and find out exactly what happened that night, Amber is asked to walk through the events of the night and bravely recount exactly what Jerry did to her and where he went. And I had to show him where the dirt road was that he had taken us. And I remember telling him everything that he said and everything that he did. With the information Amber provided, police go back to the Daniels household and meticulously gather evidence from the crime scene, collecting fingerprints, a cigarette butt, and DNA samples. Investigators believe that earlier that night, at around 1 a.m., before Jerry abducted Amber and her two younger sisters, he infiltrated the Daniels family home through a back window. He then went to the oldest daughter's room, 16-year-old Jessica, and attempted to make advances on her. Detectives believe she must have resisted, running to the safety of her parents' bedroom. But then Jerry, having been to the house multiple times before, navigated to the cabinet where the family stored their shotgun. Seizing the firearm, Jerry proceeded to enter the parents' bedroom, murdering 16-year-old Jessica, the two adults, Kim and Danny, and 8-year-old Brian before running out of ammunition. He then entered Amber's bedroom and took her and the sisters. With all of Amber's details and their physical evidence from the crime scenes, they have enough information to make the arrest, but Jerry is still evading capture, nowhere to be found. Police use all available resources to track him down. I have never seen so much officer presence. Investigators suspect he might be hiding in his mother's home in Alma, Georgia, only an hour from the crime scene. Several police officers are en route to Jerry's mother's address. However, upon their arrival, there is no sign of him anywhere. Their search extends around the outside of the house until they finally discover him, hiding underneath the floorboards in a small crawl space. Jerry Scott Heidler is charged and arrested with four counts of murder, three counts of kidnapping, and burglary. He didn't resist. He confessed to it, admitted to it, and he, he said it was like a dream to him. As Jerry is in prison awaiting trial, Amber is processing the tragedy that happened to her family. She has lost her mother, father, older sister, and younger brother right before Christmas. Christmas was a big part of our, our family every year. That was our thing. But this year, when the night of December 24th finally comes, there is no celebration, no cheer, only grief. That's when the realization hit. They weren't coming back. August 30th, 1999, the trial for Jerry Scott Heidler begins. Amber is now 13 years old, and her interview is played during the trial and used as evidence against him. The whole community is emotional, devastated by the traumatic incident that went through their small town. It only takes the jury 20 minutes to come back with the verdict. We, the jury, fixed the sentence at death. On December 2nd, 1999, Jerry Scott Heidler is convicted of four counts of malice murder kidnapping, aggravated child molestation, and burglary. He is sentenced to death and currently remains on death row. That's the only time that I witnessed Jerry Heidler showing any remorse. He dropped his head and a tear came in his eye. So long as he couldn't get out and couldn't hurt anybody else, I was perfectly fine. It's been more than two decades after the tragedy. Today, Amber is not letting her past define her, determined to live her life to the fullest. Amber's mother overcame personal struggles to ensure her children would grow up feeling loved. Now, 
Amber has started a family of her own. She pours love and attention into her child, making it her mission to recreate the nurturing and beautiful home life her own mother worked hard to build. Knowing that I get to see him grow up. I miss that with my mom. He is my future. <laughs> Faden is the future for me. I pray that he never has to go through anything that I ever went through as a child. I pray that he has the good days that I had. I would do anything for him. Amber realized that what happened to her as a child was not her fault. Letting go of the anger from her past, knowing it doesn't create love for her family in the present. I'm at a point in my life that if I could go tell him that I forgive him for what he did, I would. I can't change the past, but I can make my future better for myself, for my family. If I'm going to hate him for the rest of my life, what's the point? I will always be the better person. Gretchen Eleanor Harrington was born on June 13, 1967, in the quiet town of Marple Township, Pennsylvania. She was the beloved daughter of Harold Boyd Harrington and Ina Cover Harrington. Gretchen had three sisters, Zoe, Anne, and Jessica. The girls grew up in a household filled with love and sibling companionship. Their close bond and support undoubtedly played a crucial role in shaping Gretchen's character and forming cherished memories. Her father, Harold Harrington, was a pastor and dedicated his life to serving various congregations of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America. On the morning of August 15, 1975, Eight-year-old Gretchen Harrington left her home on 27 Lawrence Road in Brumal, Pennsylvania, with her Bible in one hand. She was on her way to go to summer Bible school camp at the Trinity Church Chapel Christian Reformed Church on 140 Lawrence Road. This was the premises of two local churches. Gretchen's father was the pastor of the one church, and David Zanstra was the pastor of the secondary church. She was eager to attend Bible school. Usually, she walked the half mile with her older sisters, Zoe and Harriet. But on this particular day, though, her mom, Ina, was bringing home her newborn baby, Jessica. Zoe and Harriet preferred to stay home and wait for their arrival. Pastor Harrington encouraged Gretchen to go to Bible school to keep up her perfect attendance record. Therefore, Gretchen was all alone as her father waved goodbye to her. She began her stroll up the hill to the church just after 9 a.m. A child walking alone on a sunny summer day in a place like Marple was hardly unusual. It was not regarded as dangerous or risky. This was the 1970s, in a leafy suburb. Kids played various games outside till all hours. They played on the streets, in the dark, and in the woods. They cooled off in Darby Creek, which ran behind Gretchen's home without a care in the world. Kids walked to their friends' houses blocks away. No cell phones or GPS watches to tether them to their parents. Marple was as safe as safe could be. At around 9 to 9.30 a.m., the children arrived at the camp, and the first activity on the agenda was a morning exercise session, led by David Zonstra, the other pastor. At approximately 10 a.m., half of the children were then transported to the Reformed Presbyterian Church for the remainder of the day. Zanstro was one of the people responsible for transporting the children. At 10.30, Gretchen's father became concerned when she had not arrived yet at the second church where he was waiting. Harold began searching Lawrence Road to see if maybe Gretchen had wandered off or went home. When he could not find Gretchen, Harold contacted Zanstra's wife, Margaret, who was at the Trinity Church, to find out if Gretchen was still there and if David Zonstra perhaps knew if she was transported to the other church. Margaret told Harold that her husband returned to Trinity Chapel after transporting children. 
He was somewhere on the property of the church and had not seen Gretchen that day. The Harringtons and Zanstras knew each other well. The two families lived close to one another. Both dads were in the same line of work, and both moms filled the stereotypical role of pastor's wife. One of Zanstra's daughters was Gretchen's best friend. When David Zanstra learned that Gretchen's father was looking for her, he called the Marple Township Police Department at Harold Harrington's request and reported Gretchen missing. The call was made at 11.23 a.m., and Zanstra described Gretchen to the police as an eight-year-old girl with blonde hair in pigtails, three feet six inches tall, 50 pounds, wearing dark blue shorts with a zipper and snap in the front, pockets on each side of the front, and no visible buttons, and a white top. Quite a detailed description for someone who apparently did not see Gretchen on that day. As the sun set that day, just before 8 p.m., there was still no sign of Gretchen. Margaret Zanstra brought supper to the Harrington home, where Ina, Gretchen's mother, seemed resigned to the fact that she would never see her daughter alive again. Margaret commented, She was just kind of accepting the fact that Gretchen was gone. I do not know whether she was just putting on a brave face. I think she was in shock. Gretchen's disappearance sent shockwaves through Broomall and Marple Township. The people went into full-blown panic mode. By Saturday, hundreds of people were involved in the search for Gretchen. A Pennsylvania State Police helicopter searched the area continuously from above. Friends and family members began handing out flyers to passing motorists in the area. The flyers showed Gretchen in her most recent school photo sporting a missing tooth and a childish grin. There was a lot of speculation, so many unanswered questions. Had she run away? Did she drown in a creek? Did a stranger kidnap her? Was it somebody she knew? People and church members who searched for little eight-year-old Gretchen said her disappearance destroyed the belief that their community was safe. Karen Frank Zetterberg was a Bible school classmate of Gretchen. They were the same age and lived in the same tightly knit community. After Gretchen's disappearance, Karen's mom took her to the hairdresser to cut her hair real short in order for her to look like a boy. She did not want her daughter to stand out with her long hair. Karen was also not allowed to walk alone to her piano lessons and to the swim club anymore. Paul Barton, who lived in nearby Newton Square, heard about the search on his police scanner while he was relaxing in his backyard pool. He soon drove down to Darby Creek to join a search team. His group combed a grassy hill. Barton recalled, there was just this very solemn feeling amongst all of us who were out there searching. We went out there not knowing what to expect, what we might find. We were looking for something, anything, but we found nothing. Nobody did. That Sunday, just two days after Gretchen's disappearance, police called off the large-scale search operation. Investigators had little to go on. The police chief told a local newspaper, we haven't got a clue. No useful clues of any kind were found by the search parties. In the weeks that followed, the police spoke with several people to piece together what had happened to Gretchen. On August 17, 1975, the interviews began for the investigation. Witnesses, camp teachers, students, and parents were interviewed by police, providing various important facts for the case. The crucial pieces of information were the observation of either a green station wagon or light top, dark bottom Cadillac stopping to talk to a girl near the church. Another fact that was brought up was that the camp's daily routine was broken on August 15th because the group at Trinity Church stayed 45 to 50 minutes longer than usual. The investigation took a turn on August 19th when a small pair of shorts were found on a fence post in Westchester, Pennsylvania. 
David Zanstra was called in to talk to police, based around the fact that he provided such a specific description of Gretchen's shorts, although, according to him, he never saw her that day, since she never arrived to camp. The shorts found in Westchester ultimately ended up not being Gretchen's, but investigators were still left questioning how Zanstra knew such specific details about her shorts. When investigators interviewed Zanstra on August 19th, he told them that he had picked up some children and driven them to the church the day Gretchen went missing. He still denied having seen her that day. On October 14th, two months after Gretchen disappeared, a jogger in Ridley Creek State Park, about 20 minutes from Gretchen's home, stumbled on human remains. At first, he was not sure what he had found, until he saw what was clearly a fingernail. He ran to fetch a park ranger. Gretchen's parents confirmed that the distinctive clothing found with the remains was hers. Ina made the girl's clothes by hand. The remains found were of a small human body, which the autopsy later revealed was indeed Gretchen Harrington's. Dental records were used for identification purposes. Dr. Halbert Fillinger performed the autopsy. He found a cranial cerebral injury and stated that Gretchen had suffered two or more blunt impacts to her skull, leaving her with a depressed skull fracture. Police suspected that she had been assaulted as well, though the autopsy revealed no evidence of that. The heart-wrenching discovery left everyone mourning the loss of a promising young life. The Sunday after Gretchen's body was found, her father Harold delivered a sermon at church. Gretchen, with her simple faith in Christ, is free, he declared. But the perpetrator is in terrible bondage. The world is filled with unspeakable evil because of the wickedness of the human who knows the truth but will not accept it. The discovery in the woods led to a new frenzy of activity in the case. Witnesses came forward with reports of men of various descriptions they had seen in the area where Gretchen was found. Police received numerous tips, some sounding very promising, some completely frivolous. On October 30, 1975, David Zanstra was called back to the police station for a further interview about the morning of August 15th. Zanstra told police that he started picking up children for the opening session at 9.10 a.m. and was finished with the pickups and back at Trinity Chapel by 9.30 a.m. He denied ever seeing Gretchen and told police that he was unaware she was even missing until he was called to the Reformed Church at 11.05 a.m. by Harold Harrington, Gretchen's father. Investigators looked into a series of potential suspects, including several known offenders of assault living in the area. Nothing led to an arrest. What happened to Gretchen became a mystery for decades. No one knew who took her life. The case went cold. Joanna Falcon Sullivan was only nine years old in 1975 when Gretchen's slaying took place. She was born and stayed in Broomall, Delaware County at the time. The case had always haunted Sullivan. She became a veteran journalist and wrote a true crime book detailing the ongoing investigation in Gretchen's case. Sullivan said, I had wanted to write this story for decades. I grew up in Broomall. My co-author, Mike Mathis, grew up in Broomall as well. He grew up in Lawrence Park, where this happened. It affected both of us as kids, and it affected a lot of kids our age. Sullivan started the book during the pandemic, and Marple's Gretchen Harrington tragedy was released in October 2022. The novel was Sullivan's first book, but she said she does plan to revise this true crime book to reflect any updated information about this case as it unfolds. Naturally, when detectives retire or pass away, other investigators inherit their cold cases. In the case of Gretchen, Sergeant Coffin became the head investigator. 
when a woman called Marple Police and wanted to talk to somebody about Gretchen, her message went to Coffin's phone. He was sitting at Marple Township Police Headquarters when he heard the voicemail. The woman said she thought she knew who was responsible for what happened to Gretchen and talked about an attempted kidnapping around the same time. She also mentioned that she kept a diary in the 1970s in which she recorded some of this information when she was a 10-year-old girl living in Havertown, about three miles east of Marple. The woman still had the diary in her possession after all these years. Sergeant Coffin got in touch with Pennsylvania State Police. Though the case remained open with the Marple cops because Gretchen had last been seen in their jurisdiction, the state police technically became the lead investigatory agency once the remains were found in the state park. Coffin noted, Besides, I have four detectives in my division. The state police have so many more resources. State troopers scheduled an interview with the woman. She is designated in court documents only by her initials, SF and CI number one the terminology used for confidential informant. The interview would turn out to be a monumental development in a cold case that had been unsolved for nearly half a century. And monumental developments in decades-old cold cases do not happen that often. The woman told the state troopers on January 2, 2023, that she had been childhood friends with Gretchen and Zoe Harrington, one of Gretchen's sisters. She was also friends with David Zanstra's daughters, Mara and Kristen, and that she would often play at the Zanstra home. She frequently slept over at their house. During one of these sleepovers, when she was 10, she told the troopers she awoke in the middle of the night to find Pastor Zanstra touching her inappropriately. She shifted her position and he immediately hurried from the room. The next night, he touched her again, she said. When the girls woke up the following morning, the woman said, she mentioned David Zanstra's odd behavior to Mara, his one daughter, and then Mara told her something to the effect of, he does that sometimes, and sometimes I hear my sister crying in the middle of the night. When the girl related the incidents to her parents, they told her she was not allowed to sleep over at the Zanstra house anymore. Notably, police believed the incident in question occurred exactly one week before Gretchen vanished. A short time afterwards, the Zanstras moved to Plano, Texas, a Dallas suburb. The confidential informant also told state police about another child in the neighborhood with whom she was friends, a girl named Holly. According to her, somebody had attempted to kidnap Holly. She wrote the following entry in her diary, which she turned over to the state troopers. In one entry dated September 15, 1975, she wrote, Guess what? A man tried to kidnap Holly twice. It is a secret, so I cannot tell anyone, but I think he might be the one who kidnapped Gretchen. I think it was Mr. Z. She confirmed to the troopers that the Z stood for a Zanstra. Local police had questioned Zanstra twice back in 1975, along with many other people. Some witnesses had said they saw Gretchen outside a car, talking to someone sitting inside on the morning she disappeared. Some of the descriptions of the car matched one of Zanstra's, but Zanstra always insisted he had not seen Gretchen on the day in question. Bizarrely, though, as you, the viewer, would already have noted, there was an investigatory gap never explained by Marple police. Zanstra was able to give an accurate and detailed description of the homemade shorts Gretchen was wearing that day even though he supposedly had not seen her. Sadly, the original Marple detective in her case passed away in June of 2020, and therefore there is no explanation for the investigatory gap. In June 2023, 
State troopers tracked Zanstra down to a lakefront home in Marietta, Georgia. He and his wife had moved there. Zanstra agreed to meet the troopers at the headquarters of the Cobb County Police Department on July 17, 2023. The troopers questioned Zanstra about Gretchen's disappearance, and he denied any involvement. Then they revealed the newest allegations to him, that the pastor had assaulted his own daughters and a best friend. David Zanstra then finally came clean to investigators on what really occurred on the morning of August 15, 1975. Jack Stolsteimer, the Delaware County District Attorney, outlined Zanstra's confession about what happened. Once Gretchen was out of her father's view, Zanstra then invited her into his green AMC Rambler station wagon. Instead of driving her to church, he drove her to a secure wooded area, parked the car, and asked her to take off her clothes. She refused and responded that she wanted to go home. He struck Gretchen with his fist, and she began bleeding from her head. After feeling her pulse and her appearing lifeless, he carried her out of the car and attempted to cover her body with sticks. He then left and went on with his day. Due to the nature of the close relationship the Harringtons had with the Zanstras, investigators determined that Zanstra had the means, motive, and opportunity to take Gretchen's life. David Zanstra was taken into custody in Georgia on July 17, 2023. He is currently being held in Cobb County, where he has been denied bail. A DNA sample was collected from Zanstra that would be compared to DNA collected in other open cases in Pennsylvania and across the country. Investigators believe that it is unlikely Zanstra is not involved in other crimes, considering he worked with children for decades. Phil Stoddard, a detective in Marietta, Georgia, who sat in on the Zanstra interview, told a TV news crew there that Zanstra was emotionless during his confession to the troopers. Trooper Eugene Trey conducted the interview. Afterwards, Trey said, I do not know if he is sorry for what he did, but this is a weight off his shoulders for sure. On Monday, 24th July, 2023, Delco officials announced the arrest of 83-year-old David Zanstra in connection with Gretchen's kidnapping and slaying. Zanstra was born in May 1940. He was still working as a pastor in Georgia at the time of his arrest. Delaware County District Attorney Jack Stolsteimer said, he is every parent's worst nightmare. This heinous act left a family and a community forever changed. At long last, I can announce today that David Zanstra had admitted to this crime. Justice has been a long time coming, but we are proud and grateful to finally be able to give the community an answer. We have to realize that most people in this world are good and that most pastors, especially people who claim to be men of God, are good people. But there have always been people, and there always will be people, who are this cold-hearted, remorseless, and just evil. Thank God there is law enforcement here to hold them accountable. And however long this takes, we are going to do it, because this young lady should be alive. What happened to her is just horrendous. Stolsteimer added that Zanstra was fighting extradition to Pennsylvania and that his office was seeking a governor's warrant to bring Zanstra to Delaware County. The district attorney's office will submit a petition for requisition. Once approved, arrangements will be made to have representatives from the Delaware County Sheriff's Office pick up Zanstra and bring him to Pennsylvania. The process could take as long as two months. Stolsteimer added, We are going to try him, we are going to convict him, and he is going to stay in jail for the rest of his life. Then he is going to have to find out what the God he professes to believe in holds for those who are this evil to our children. 
He slayed with his bare hands this poor young girl and then lied about it for 48 years. He ended this girl's life that he knew and who trusted him. And then he acted as if he was a family friend, not only during her burial and funeral, but for years. Chief Graff of the police department in Marple Township said during Monday's press conference, if you're a praying person, you can certainly pray for Gretchen. And I do not think she needs it. She is in God's hands. You can certainly pray for the evil man responsible for this because he is going to need it. The charges filed against Zanstra have brought a sense of closure to Broomall, Pennsylvania, which has been haunted by Gretchen's case for nearly 48 years. Gretchen's demise had transformed this community. Pre-August 1975, it was any town, USA. Post that day, it changed everything for the kids, for the parents, for the families, for everybody, because nobody could do anything anymore in the innocence that they used to do it before this happened. Jim Cristaldi, who as a youth delivered newspapers to the Harringtons, spoke fondly of a pre-disappearance childhood in which he and his friends would spend countless hours building forts in the woods with only the light of the moon. But right after Gretchen vanished, Cristaldi, a teenager at the time, found himself in search parties in those same woods looking for Gretchen, or anything that might have led to her whereabouts. We were innocent, and this absolutely shattered our innocence. Pennsylvania State Police Lieutenant Jonathan Sunderland said in a statement, Justice does not have an expiration date. Whether a crime happened 50 years ago or five minutes ago, the residents of the Commonwealth can have confidence that law enforcement will not rest until justice is served. This case has been investigated by generations of detectives, and they all are owed a debt of gratitude for never giving up. Particular recognition is due today to Corporal Andrew Martin, of the Criminal Investigation Assessment Unit and Missing Persons Unit. His determination to build upon the work of his predecessors and his belief that the case could still be solved have been instrumental in getting us to today's announcement. Michelle Delon, President and CEO of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children said, today's announcement is a testament to the power of perseverance and a family and community's commitment to justice. Regardless of how much time has passed, we know answers can be found. As we mark this achievement, we applaud the incredible efforts of the Delaware County District Attorney's Office, the Pennsylvania State Police, the Marple Township Police, and their partner law enforcement agencies, and the Cobb County Police Department for their unwavering dedication in this case. Days like today fuel our ongoing passion to protect children, and we're keeping Gretchen's family in our thoughts, as well as the many other families out there who are still searching for answers. David Zanstra has been charged with taking Gretchen's life in the first, second, and third degree, as well as kidnapping of a minor and the possession of an instrument of crime. The website of the Christian Reformed Church lists Zanstra as a retired minister and said he was ordained on September 20th, 1965. In addition to the Trinity Chapel Christian Reformed Church in Brumall, Zanstra also served at churches in New Jersey, California, and Texas between 1965 and 2005. The Christian Reformed Church said in a statement on Monday, that had wanted to extend their condolences to the family of Gretchen Harrington. We are additionally grieved to hear that a CRC pastor has been arrested in the case. We recognize that we live in a broken and sinful world where violence can happen anywhere by anyone, even within our churches and by leaders we hold to the highest standards. David Zanstra's wife, Margaret Zanstra, did not immediately respond to a request for comment after her husband's arrest. 
While the Marple community now has most of the answers it had been seeking for all these decades, many of the residents had not found peace in the shocking turn of events. It was much easier to believe that some outsider had done this, some deranged, itinerant offender who had somehow wandered into town, snatched up a young girl, and then disappeared just as quickly, taking his evil with him to whatever unfortunate place he landed next. Instead, it was a respected member of their community, a religious leader with a wife and young girls of his own, a wife who had brought supper to the family of the girl he's confessed to slay. Karen Frank Zetterberg, Gretchen's Bible school classmate, observed, Back then, everybody was surprised that Gretchen would get into a car with a stranger, and now to find out that this monster was hiding amongst us in plain sight all the time, it is just sickening. We were always taught in church that evil exists in the world, but you do not really understand evil until something like this happens. We were far too young to learn about evil the way we did. Sullivan, who wrote the book on Gretchen's case, said after the announcement, I was stunned. The fact that this case is finally, potentially, coming to a close, it is very exciting to hear this news. It is still very sad, you know. We cannot change what happened. I interviewed Zanstra, his wife, and his daughter when doing research for my book. Zanstra had a murky recollection of the day Gretchen went missing. There was a sense of fear and apprehension in Brumall. I remember seeing a helicopter flying over our neighborhood in the search effort for Gretchen. That image stayed with me for the rest of my life. Sullivan's book was just released last year, and CBS News Philadelphia talked to her about whether she believed it may have led to a break in this case. Sullivan replied, We started interviewing people. We went to Marple Police Department and were able to comb through the cold case files kept by Chief Brandon Graff, who never gave up on this unsolved case. Marple Police encouraged our research and said that we somehow contributed. I think we got people talking again. Reverend Zanstra took our calls. He answered questions about that day. There's a lot of relief and disbelief that it is actually happening. David Zanstra's neighbors in Georgia also reacted after learning about the charges against him. Karen Alsdorf said, It is shocking. I had no idea. They have just always been very nice people. Aaron Christian said, Friendly guy. I talked to him a few times. I see him walking around with his cane. The family of Gretchen Harrington released the following statement. With today's announcement of an arrest, we are extremely hopeful that the person who is responsible for the heinous crime that was committed against our Gretchen will be held accountable. It is difficult to express the emotions that we are feeling as we take one step closer to justice. Gretchen was only eight years old when she was suddenly taken away from us on her way to church on Friday, August 15, 1975. If you met Gretchen, you were instantly her friend. She exuded kindness to all and was sweet and gentle. Even now, when people share their memories of her, the first thing they talk about is how amazing she was, and still is. At just eight years old, she had a lifelong impact on those around her. The kidnapping and demise of Gretchen has forever altered our family, and we miss her every single day. We are grateful for the continual pursuit of justice by law enforcement, and we want to thank the Pennsylvania State Police for never stopping in their constant search for answers. We would not be here today if it was not for them. As a family, we ask for privacy at this time as we continue to digest this information. Thank you for your understanding, love, and continued support. It means the world to us. Gretchen's parents were married for an impressive 59 years. Her father passed away in 2021 at the remarkable age of 94. Officials said Zanstra moved around quite a few times to different churches during his 40-year tenure. He lived in California, Texas, and Georgia. 
Stolsteimer said, We are concerned that there may be more victims who might have been assaulted by this man. We want to hold him accountable for everything he did. We need to be diligent. If anyone has any information about that, if David Zanstra ever committed an act against you, please reach out to District Attorney Joffrey Payne or the Pennsylvania State Police. From what should have been a 10-minute walk down the road turned into a cold case that gripped a whole community for nearly 50 years. This is 911. Do you have an emergency? Um, I just ran away from home. Do you know what street you're on? Um, no. Uh, I just ran away from home because I live in a family of 15, okay? Can you hear me? And we have abusing parents. Did you hear that? Okay, how did they abuse you? Okay. They hit us, they throw us across, they like to throw us across the room. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. I have two, my two little sisters right now are chained up. Okay, how Did old you are you? I'm 17. What's your name? Golden Turkin. Okay, I'm gonna connect you to the service department so that they can help. What? One moment, don't hang up. I won't. Jordan? You are looking at the body camera footage from the deputy as he arrives. Hey, what's going on? Okay. I just ran away from home. Okay. And I live in a family of 15. Okay. My two little sisters right now are chained up. They're chained up? Yes. Where are they chained up at? On their bed. Now, mother didn't chain them up just to be me. Okay. Perfect. They're chained up because they stole mother's food. Uh huh. But I'm sorry if I talk too much. Okay. I've never talked to anybody out there, so I don't. I don't I've never been alone with the person, so <clears throat> this is very hard for me to talk. Okay. How did you? Do your parents know you left your house? No, they home. Sorry. Do you take any medication? What's the medication? Medication? Yeah. What's the medication? Do you take pills? Do you take pills? Oh, I don't think I've ever taken a pill before. Okay. Right, I haven't. Um, but... The girl with the strange vocabulary nervously puts on a little hat, a reminder of one of her sisters right. who's depending on her. Our parents are abusing. They abuse us. But the reason I called and the reason I managed to get out here, this is one of the most scary things I've ever done. Uh -huh. I'm terrified. But I called because my two little sisters, they're chained up right now. Do you have pictures of that? Yes, I can show you. I actually didn't have it, and then one of my sisters told me I need to get pictures. You have pictures of your sisters chained up? Yes, but uh, they're, yeah, they're in here. Okay. I, I don't have proof of everything, but I have proof that my sisters are chained up. So, see? She doesn't seem to know the word bruised. Wait, you can look at that. See, those are the places that make a know that. And see how dirty she is? We are so filthy. We, we, we don't take baths. We don't. How did your sisters get like this? Okay. Your parents yeah, chained them up? Yes, because they stole food. Okay. But they stole it because they were hungry. Who took this picture? I did. I took those pictures. <laughs> okay. You make sure to save these, okay? Okay, I will. Don't get rid of those. I will. I want the AM on January 17th of 2020, Michael Valva called 911 to report that his son was unconscious after falling on the pavement. Police officer Cassidy Lessard responded to the call. When she entered the home around 9.46 AM, she went down to the basement and found that Thomas was unconscious on the floor. She stated that he had no pulse and he was extremely cold to the touch. She did attempt CPR in the basement, but Thomas was not responding at all. She then carried him to the ambulance, where they continued CPR, but medics were never able to revive Thomas. Paramedics took Thomas's temperature inside of the ambulance, and they found that his internal temperature was reading at only 76.1 degrees. Shortly after Thomas arrived at the hospital, he was pronounced deceased, but it was believed that he was already deceased before police even arrived to the house. 
So what actually happened? How is it possible that a child's temperature could get so low that it reaches the temperature of 76.1 degrees? Shortly after the paramedics left, Sergeant Gregory Terzer arrived to the home and wanted to speak with Angela as soon as possible to get an idea of what exactly happened to Thomas that morning. Angela told him that Michael and Thomas were outside waiting for the school bus when Thomas fell on the driveway. She stated that Michael brought him in through the garage and into the basement to clean him off because apparently Thomas had had an accident after the fall. She told the sergeant that Thomas was crying excessively, but she really didn't think anything of it because, quote, this was common for him because he had autism. She stated that they then took him over to the downstairs shower to clean him off, and this is when he stopped breathing and lost consciousness. When police asked Michael about what happened that morning, he stated that he was actually watching Thomas at the bus stop from inside of the home when he got distracted. He said that he turned around and saw Thomas was lying face down on the driveway, but he never actually saw him fall. He stated that he went outside and picked him up and noticed that Thomas had some scrapes on his face, but no serious injuries. He did say that Thomas defecated on himself after this, so this is why he brought him back into the house to get him cleaned up. Michael stated that Thomas was complaining about being cold, so this is when he put him into a warm shower and suddenly Thomas stopped breathing and lost consciousness. Both Angela and Michael had different stories about what happened that morning. So now we know what Michael and Angela claimed happened to Thomas Valva, but what actually happened to him. Surveillance cameras that were located throughout the home told a much different story about what happened to Thomas Valva that morning. On the night of January 16th, the night before Thomas died, video footage shows Angela dragging Thomas and A down the stairs and throwing them into the garage. She did this because Thomas had an accident inside of his room, so she took both Thomas and A and decided to punish them by throwing them into the garage. The temperature this night was below freezing, reportedly just 19 degrees outside. The garage was almost completely bare with no mattress, no blankets, no pillows, no food, no water, and no access to a bathroom. It was found that on this night, the boys were forced to stay in this garage for almost 12 hours hours. Angela also took a video of Thomas as he was shivering on the concrete floor in the garage that night. She sent this video over to Michael while he was at work and said she wasn't sure if they should send Thomas to school in the morning. Michael responded with, quote, fuck that piece of shit, he's not going anywhere. The following morning, when Michael went out to the garage to get the boys, he found that Thomas had actually had an accident inside of the garage. Surveillance camera video shows Michael screaming at Thomas after finding this, saying, quote, Stop pooping, I should make you eat this shit. He then dragged Thomas out onto the pavement outside and began spraying him down with freezing cold water from the hose. So, after being forced to stay in a garage in below freezing temperatures for over 12 hours, Michael then decides to spray down his son with freezing cold water. The video footage shows that as Thomas was being hosed down with water, he fell face first into the pavement, and this is when he fell unconscious. You can hear Michael then begins to yell at Thomas, saying, Fuck you, moron, walk. Angela heard this, and she yelled at Michael to lower his voice so that the neighbors wouldn't hear him. He responded, saying, quote, He's cold, boo fucking who. All of this happened 50 minutes before they even called 911. And this is a big reason why it is believed that Thomas passed away even before police arrived at the home. Michael and Angela were both arrested just one week after Thomas died on January 24th of 2020. I need ambulance immediately. My son's not breathing. Okay, stay on the line. You sure he's not breathing? I don't know. <laughs> to be okay. honest. Now to a disturbing story on Long Island where an NYPD officer and his fiance face murder charges in the death of the officer's son. It wasn't until I heard and saw what you said and did in this trial that I think we all realized how evil you really are. I know Tommy was a fighter who always stand for the truth. And that's why he died for the truth. He's a hero. He was opposing the abuse. But how much could he handle? He was only eight years old. 
On January 17th of 2020, NYPD officer Michael Valva called 911 to report that his 8-year-old son was unresponsive after falling on the pavement outside. When paramedics arrived, they found 8-year-old Thomas Valva was unconscious and had a temperature of just 76.1 degrees. Just a few hours later, Thomas passed away at the hospital from hypothermia. After Thomas passed away, it was discovered that for the past three years, his father and his father's fiance have been subjecting him and his brother to severe and horrific abuse. With over 20 different complaints to CPS and a loving mother who tried everything in her power to get them back and keep them safe, the state of New York did absolutely nothing to help these children and unfortunately Thomas had to die for anyone to see this. This is the case of Thomas Falva. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you are new here. I cannot even believe what has happened on this channel since my last upload. I just want to thank you all so, so much for all of the sweet comments and thank all of you guys for actually sitting and watching Naven's video and listening to his entire case. I can't even believe that one person on here actually enjoys listening to me talk. So thank you guys so much for all the sweet comments. I really appreciate it. I want to keep this intro kind of short because we have a very long episode ahead of us. So with all of that being said, let's start talking about Thomas Valva. Thomas Justin Valva was born on September 14th of 2011 to the parents Michael Valva and Justina Zubko Valva. Two years before Thomas was born, Justina and Michael did have another child, and we will call him A. And after Thomas, a third child was born as well. Thomas's younger brother does not come up often in this video, so I will not be naming him. If I do have to refer to him, I will call him Thomas's younger brother. The abuse that was inflicted upon these boys was mostly directed towards A and Thomas, and it's believed because they were both autistic. Justina Zubko actually moved to the United States from Polska, Poland. During the time of their marriage, Michael was an NYPD officer out of Brooklyn, and according to the documents that I was able to find online, he started in 2005 and was not fired until October of 2020. This is nine months after he murdered his own son. I do think that both of these are important details because it really shows the difference in how both of these parents were treated by state officials. On December 30th of 2015, Michael filed for divorce from Justina. Justina initially retained custody of the three children while the divorce was pending. Michael hired an attorney by the name of Donna McCobb to represent him during the divorce. Donna informed the judge that was handling this case, Judge Zimmerman, that Justina was interfering with her access to the children and was not letting her interview them. After this, Judge Zimmerman granted custody over to Michael, but he did allow Justina to have unsupervised visitation at the time. After Michael was awarded custody of the children, he filed a CPS report against Justina claiming that she was hitting them and poisoning them with a toxic brown medicine. He also claimed that Justina was suffering from a deteriorating mental illness that rendered her incapable of caring for her children. One day after Michael filed this report, a CPS investigator named Michelle Clark visited Thomas and A at their school. They told Michelle that their mother has never used physical punishment on them, and they were not afraid of her. They loved being around her. This complaint made by Michael was eventually closed. In October of 2016, Michael proposed to Angela Polina at a Yankees game that they both attended. Michael and his three sons then moved into a home with Angela and her three daughters. Starting in November of 2017, this is when the CPS complaints against the family really started to begin. On November 6th of 2017, Justina filed a complaint with CPS regarding her sons living with Michael. In this complaint, she reported that the boys were being starved at their father's house and that A, who was 8 years old at the time, had lost 4 pounds in less than a month. She also reported that Michael was hitting the children on their heads, hands, and backs, and that Michael and Angela would force the boys to stay in timeouts for several hours at a time with nothing to eat or drink. 
Michelle Clark, the CPS investigator, actually closed this complaint just two days after Justina filed it on November 9th of 2017. On December 19th of 2017, Justina met with Michelle Clark and two of her supervisors, Edward Heap and Robert Leto. Justina told all three of these CPS employees that she was extremely worried for her children. She told them that the boys were losing weight while they were living with their father, their educational needs were not being met, and that the boys were being forced to stand outside in the snow with no shoes on for hours at a time. Justina claimed that at this meeting, she provided them with a flash drive that contained 320 files of direct evidence that Michael and Angela were abusing the children. This flash drive allegedly contained photos, video, and audio, all of the boys being abused. It also contained letters from the children's pediatrician and neuropsychologist who both reported that Justina was a loving parent and there was no signs that she had ever abused the children when they were in her care. She also provided them with audio and video files of Angela and Michael trying to brainwash the children by forcing them to say things like, I don't love my mommy, my mommy is mean, or I don't want to stay with mommy. On January 2nd of 2018, Justina filed another child abuse complaint against Michael. In this complaint, she stated how her previous complaint was closed out with no investigation and she was still concerned for the exact same things in her first complaint. On January 14th of 2018, Justina filed a third report against Michael after she found severe bruising on Thomas's bottom. Thomas told Justina that Michael had hit him 12 times the day before. After CPS investigated this complaint, they filed a neglect petition against Michael for using excessive corporal punishment. It wasn't until March 7th of 2018 when an order of protection was issued directing Michael to refrain from any domestic violence and the use of corporal punishment against his boys. On January 16th of 2018, Justina threatened to file a complaint against Michelle Clark for conducting a CPS investigation in a biased and unfair manner. She also blamed Michelle for the attack on Thomas after she did absolutely nothing to help him. Just a few days after this, Michelle Clark filed a neglect petition against Justina, and Justina claims that this was in retaliation for her filing a direct complaint against Michelle Clark, and this is exactly what I think as well. Michelle Clark was eventually removed from the Valva case in February of 2018, and she was replaced with two other workers, Jennifer Lance and Melissa Estrada. On April 25th of 2018, the boys' school submitted a complaint to CPS. This complaint stated that Michael and Angela did not understand the depth of the boys' disabilities and what they truly struggled with on a day-to-day -day basis by having autism. This complaint also stated that both boys had lost weight when they were supposed to gain weight. A, for example, had lost 11 pounds in 9 months, and Thomas had lost several pounds as well. The boys' teachers also filed a complaint this day saying, the boys stated that they were often not allowed to have breakfast as a punishment for things like not saying good morning to Angela. The teacher stated that she had to provide the children with her own food so that they could actually eat throughout the day, and the boys were refusing to go to the nurse because Angela told them they were not allowed to go. On September 27th of 2018, the school's psychologist filed their first report of abuse with CPS. The reports noted that Thomas and his brother were, quote, very thin and always hungry. She was also concerned because the boys randomly began wearing pull-ups to school despite their age and despite the fact that they were already potty trained and had no problems using the bathroom in the past. In another complaint dated January 16th of 2019, the school's principal reported that Thomas came into school one day with, quote, a suspicious bruise and swollen right eye. When they tried to ask Thomas what happened to his eye, he kept giving everyone different stories on what happened. This complaint also reported that Anthony would scream and get extremely upset when his teachers would try to take him to the nurse. On February 27th of 2019, the principal and A's teacher both filed a complaint with CPS. These reports reiterated the previous concerns about A's severe weight loss, stating that he was even skinnier than he was before. And this complaint also stated that on the 25th of that month, A came to school with soaking wet clothes and he smelled like urine. Then two days later, the day of the complaint, A came to school with urine-soaked pants, socks, and shoes. And he was shivering cold and told his teacher that he was forced to stay in the garage for an unknown amount of time. 
Shortly after the February complaint from the school, CPS actually started to investigate this. And this is when Michael attempted to change the boys' school. However, the school district did reject this request, meaning the boys would remain at the same exact school. Just one day after Michael found out that his request was rejected and the boys had to stay at school, A began acting out in school in small ways like refusing to get off the bus. A actually told one of his teachers that Michael and Angela instructed him to not get off the bus, and if he kicked and screamed, they would reward him with a trip to Chuck E. Cheese. So the teachers believed that this random change in behavior was likely due to him being coerced by Angela and Michael. On one of the mornings that the teacher got him off the bus, he told them that he did not eat breakfast because he had to sleep on something called the mattress. He clarified that the mattress was a small mattress in the garage, and he explained that when he was in there, he always felt very alone and very cold. He said that he was forced to stay in the garage for days or even weeks at a time because he had a toileting accident inside of the house. In March of 2019, the principal and the boys' teachers filed four more complaints with CPS regarding the boys' concerning behaviors and the fact that A said he was forced to sleep in a cold garage. On May 14th of 2019, another teacher from the school filed a report with CPS. She noticed that when Thomas arrived at school the prior morning, he had a raised and bruised bump on the upper part of his forehead. He told his teachers that this was from Michael throwing his backpack at him the day before. The next day, Thomas told his teacher that his hand hurt because Michael squeezed it really hard after Thomas urinated on himself. When the teacher tried to take him to the nurse, he was, again, too scared to go and told her that he was not allowed to see the nurse. On June 7th of 2018, that same teacher filed another report to CPS. She noticed that when A arrived to school that morning, his nose had several bright red abrasions, both of his nostrils were caked in blood, and the bridge of his nose was very swollen. When the teacher suggested that A go to the nurse and get this checked out, he began screaming and having a meltdown. The teacher actually called Michael about this situation to ask him why his son had abrasions and blood on his nose, and Michael's response was that A had just, quote, woke up with a bloody nose. The teacher then asked Michael if he would allow the boys to go to the nurse, and Michael said he would have to ask Angela. And when Angela got on the phone, she told A to go to the bathroom and try to clean it up himself, and if it was still bleeding after that, then he can go to the nurse. I could not even imagine being the teacher in this situation. The teacher stated that A's nose got more red and more swollen throughout the day, and she also noticed that he had faint red lines on both of his wrists. On November 19th of 2018, less than two months before Thomas died, two more teachers filed a complaint with CPS. The teachers reported how they had contacted CPS numerous times about their concerns with how Michael and Angela were treating the boys, and they now had another concern to report. This report noted that A arrived to school with a cut next to his eye and a bruise on top of his ear, and on the same day, Thomas came to school with a laceration on his forehead. The boys claimed that they were hurt playing football with each other, but the teachers had a feeling that something else happened. The report also expressed concern that the boys were malnourished and that Thomas and A were, quote, always asking for more food, trying to sneak food, hide food, and eat every last crumb and morsel of food given to them. The complaint also alleges that in November of 2018, the youngest child had a BMI of 15, where Thomas and A had BMIs of 1.32 and 0 0.57. The entire time all of these complaints and reports were filed to CPS regarding the severe abuse of Thomas and A, they remained in the custody of Michael and Angela. These two boys were forced to remain in the custody of the two people that were being accused of abusing them. And these abuse reports and complaints were not only from the boy's biological mother, but from the boy's principal, their teachers, the school psychologist, and even their doctors. All of these people submitted reports about severe abuse and somehow none of them were really investigated. And I really wonder if this is because Michael Valva was an NYPD officer. Every single one of these CPS reports were closed out. Every single one of them. Ten days after CPS closed their final investigation report regarding these boys, 
Thomas Valva passed away due to the severe abuse that was inflicted upon him. Suffolk Police, 843, what is the location of emergency? Hello, do you need, hi, do you need the police? I need ambulance immediately. My son's not breathing. Okay, stay on the line. Your son, who's not breathing, how old is he? How old is he? Eight. Eight? Yes. He fell down. He banged his head. Okay. He's okay. Okay. I took him. I gave him a shower to try and help him out a little bit. Stop breathing. Okay. CPR. County Fire Rescue number 50. What's the address of the emergency? 11 Bittersweet Lane, Cinema Richards, New York, 11934. 11 Bittersweet, nearest street on the corner? Yes. Are you off no. of uh, Barberry? Mm. Sir, what's your name? My name is Michael. I'm a police officer with the city of New York. My son, I think he's, I don't know if he's breathing or not. I don't know if his heart stopped. He fell down on his way to the bus. He banged his head pretty good. I brought him in, and I'm doing CPR right now. All right. How old is he? Eight years old. Okay. Do, do you need any instructions, sir? Um, I just need somebody to get here quick. Listen, Hold I, I, already, I already sent them, okay? Help okay. is already on the way. Do you need any other kind of help? Not is your, time, is, I believe. All right, is your front door unlocked for them? Yeah. All right, keep on doing CPR. We already sent help, okay? Thirty. All right, I'm going to hang up now. Is that all right? Do you need me for anything? No, just please get somebody here. Okay, we're going to get somebody right there, okay? Sorry, number? 843. All right, thank you. Yep, no problem. Yep. All right, sir, I'm going to stay on with you till I get there, all right? Okay. What is your name? My name is Mike Valva. Mike, okay. Nineteen twenty. His belly is filling up a lot as I'm doing CPR. It's filling up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me transfer you. Let me transfer you back to rescue. All right, because they would be able to let you know if that's normal. All right. Hold on, Mike. Don't hang up. Okay. 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 You have reached okay. the county fire Just stay with me, Mike. Patches are currently processing other emergency calls. Please stay on the line. I just didn't hear a heartbeat. Do you hear a heartbeat? I couldn't hear. County fire I was number nine. Hey, no, number nine. Hey, 11 Bittersweet East Riches. I'm on with Mike. He's a police officer, uh, NYPD. His eight-year-old fell down, hit his head, not breathing. CPR is in progress. Um, he said his the child's belly is filling up. He wants to know, is this normal or not? We have rescue on the way. And police, if you could assist him further, please. Hello, sir. Are you there? Mike. Yes. Mike, rescue's back on. We have help on the way. What, he knows CPR. What, what does he need us to do? Um, he has some questions. Is that normal? What's going on? His belly is filling up like it's filling up with air. Well, if you're putting air into his mouth, then some of it is just going to go into his belly, yes. But some of it is going to go okay. into his lungs, too, and that's what we need. We need air going into his lungs if he's not breathing. If he vomits, you're going to have to turn him on his side. But you sure he's not breathing? I, I don't know, <laughs> to okay. be honest. They're on their way. What's going on right now? Does he have any medical history? No, no I... medical history. Uh, just just uh, autism spectrum. Okay. Any bleeding? Well, I mean, he cut his elbow. His, his what did he hit his head on? What did he fall on? Concrete. Concrete? Are you having fun on his back on the floor? Huh? I don't want to bother you if you're if you're busy doing CPR, but I'm just trying to make sure we have all the information we need. He's on the floor. He's flat on his back. He's on the sofa. He's on the sofa. All right, you got to get him on a hard uh, surface on the floor. All right, I'm moving him. We're in the basement, by the way. When they enter. Basement. Where's the entrance? 
Oh. Mike, where's the entrance? Front entrance. Front entrance, Jews? Okay. The door open? We'll get one right now. They're on the road. Yeah, he's not breathing. Keep going until someone takes over or tells you to stop. <laughs> They're uh, less than a minute out, sir. Less than a minute in. You can send someone to the door to meet them. Please hold us to the mic. He fell down and banged his head. He was a little messy. I took him to the shower. He's okay, okay. And all of a sudden, I thought he was breathing. So I pulled him out. Tried to have dress. Uh, yeah, our unit's on scene. Okay. Right. Okay, I'm gonna just connect. Hey, I'm gonna just pull up. Okay. What's your number? Eight four three. Thank you. Thank you. Nine. Bye. Michael Valva went to trial in November of 2022. In his defense, he claimed that he was not the mastermind behind the abuse, and it was actually Angela. He claimed that he was always working and Angela mostly took care of the children and that Angela was just so strong and so manipulative that he just began listening to her and participating in the abuse. During Michael's trial, all of the CPS reports and the exact details of all of them were revealed. The jury heard report after report after report of CPS hearing claims that these children were being starved and abused. And report after report after report, they were just completely ignored. The medical examiner who did Thomas's autopsy testified that Thomas died after his organs began to shut down due to hypothermia. The coroner stated that Thomas had bruising to his forehead, the inside of his mouth, the back of his knees, on his right ankle, on his upper left leg, and on his bottom. He also had scrapes and abrasions on his cheeks, his nose, his upper lip, the inside of his mouth, on the right side of his chest and rib cage, and on his bottom. The coroner testified that there's absolutely no way that all of these injuries were done from a single fall, and some of the injuries were already starting to heal, meaning that they were older than the morning that Thomas died. Thomas was also suffering from effects of alopecia, and he was losing some of his hair due to the extreme amount of stress that he was constantly under. He also had a chronic kidney infection from being forced to constantly hold in his urine. Angela's trial began on March 9th of 2023. During Angela's trial, it was revealed that she actually despised these two boys specifically. Again, it's believed because these are the only two boys that had autism out of all of the children. Angela constantly called the boys stinky, disgusting, or filthy. And she was so disgusted with their presence that she eventually told them that they were not allowed to use the restroom or even shower inside of the house. She told the boys that if they had to use the restroom or clean up, they had to go outside, even if the temperature outside was freezing. She even went as far as removing all of the comfort items from the garage the boys were forced to stay in overnight. In this garage, they were unable to eat, drink, or use the restroom, but she had to make sure that they couldn't even have the smallest pleasure like reading a book. And in one of the CPS complaints you hear A refer to a mattress that was inside of the garage, yeah, she took that mattress away as well. Surprisingly, at her trial, Angela did take the stand, and she talked about what happened the morning that Thomas fell unconscious. She said, quote, Michael had the hose on him. I saw Thomas. He was looking at me. Thomas was on the floor and Mike was over him. And I said, get your hands off his mouth. 
But despite this, and even stating that she was shocked by the escalation of the punishments, Angela stated that she did not think Thomas was in immediate danger at the time. She even admitted to feeling like she did not need to call 911 until Thomas stopped breathing inside of the house. When they asked Angela about the temperature outside that morning, she said, quote, It was a little chilly, but I was comfortable. According to people that were inside of the courtroom at the time, this statement from Angela actually made the jurors audibly gasp. Several text messages were revealed at trial to show how both Angela and Michael were complicit in the severe abuse that was inflicted upon Thomas and A. Angela frequently texted or complained to Michael about the boys being either stinky or dirty. In a 2017 text, Angela said to Michael, quote, I don't care. They're going to school. No fucking breakfast. I'm not feeding nobody. I'm done with the stupidity of your children. I'm taking care of my own fucking kids. CPS had better not send me no more reports. In another text, Angela texted Michael about the boys misbehaving and not listening, to which Michael responded, quote, I will beat them until they bleed. In another text from Michael about the boy's behavior, he says, quote, I will fucking handcuff him. At one point, Angela texted Michael telling him the garage was too comfortable. In this text message, Angela said, quote, everything is coming out of there. Books, clothes, you've made it too comfortable of a punishment because you've made it a home. You shouldn't make it a home for them. In another text from Angela, she texted Michael a clip of the surveillance footage that was inside of the garage. In this clip, you can see Thomas grab a dirty towel from the laundry basket and he attempted to use it as a blanket because he was obviously extremely cold. And Michael responded to this text saying, quote, S-O-B, which if you don't know what that means, it means son of a bitch. One very important text message that I want to point out was from November 16th of 2019. Michael texted Angela, quote, I'll beat them up again. Talking don't work. Maybe a bloody face will. He already peed. No problem. I'll be kicking his ass again. Tell them I'm going to kick their ass again. Like I said, I'm going to hit them with the belt. And I want to refer back to one of the CPS complaints dated November 19th of 2019. This was three days after that text message. And again, in this report, it noted that A had arrived to school with a cut next to his eye and a bruise on top of his ear, and Thomas had a laceration on his forehead. On November 4th of 2022, a jury found Michael Valva guilty of the murder of his son, Thomas Valva. He was found guilty of four counts of endangering the welfare of a child and one count of second-degree murder. On December 8th of 2022, Michael was sentenced to 25 years to life. It's clear from the evidence, Your Honor, Thomas was unconscious and injured, and the defendant failed to get him any help. He didn't even suggest it, nor did Angela Polina. He didn't even bring him inside where it was warm, despite knowing that Thomas fell because he was cold. And we will all never forget, why did he fall? Because he was cold. Who fucking who? and he didn't call 911 until he had no choice but to call. Your Honor, I submit to you that child was cold, he was dead, and he was naked in that garage. When at 901, this defendant said, Ange, could I talk to you for a second? You heard it in his voice, we all heard it in his voice, and it was obvious by everything we all heard from the Nest video that at least as early at that moment, the defendant knew Thomas was dead, and it still took him another 39 minutes before he called 911. Your Honor, that only happened after he left Thomas dead and alone in the basement, an eight-year-old little boy. His body so cold to the touch, his lips blue, his heart in cardiac arrest, his exceedingly thin little eight-year-old body no longer breathing. While he and Angela concocted a story for the police for why there was a dead child in their basement, who, as we learned from Dr. Kaplan, should not have been dead, but for having succumbed to his hypothermic state, which the defendants created. Your Honor, that behavior, that complete and utter disregard for his son's life, deserves nothing less than the maximum sentence of 25 years to life. 
Your Honor, I would also ask you to please consider the defendant's lies on the day Thomas died. Lies designed to protect himself and Angela Polina at the expense of Thomas's life. Please consider that he and Angela deleted Ness video in an effort to save themselves, having done nothing, nothing at all, to save Thomas Galva that morning. And please consider that when the police came to arrest him, he and Angela were nestled in their nice warm bed once again at 11 Bittersweet Lane, where they tortured their son to death. And please also consider, Your Honor, the defendant's great fortune, actually, that no matter what sentence you impose, he will have a cell with a bed and a blanket and a pillow and heat, as well as three meals a day, all the things he denied his children. And he won't have to take food out of the garbage or crumbs off the floor to survive the way Thomas and did. Uh, Mr. Valvin, do you wish to be heard? If you wish, you can stand and address the court or stay seated. It's your choice. Your Honor, first I want to express to you and everyone involved in this case, sorry, I am truly sorry. I am regretful, ashamed heartbroken and grief-stricken standing here beside, before you having contributed to the death of my son Thomas. I love Thomas with all my heart as I still love him. Never in my worst nightmare would I imagine being responsible for Thomas's death. My sons mean everything to me. I wanted them to grow up in a loving and happy family. I fought so hard to obtain custody for my boys because I wanted to give them the best life that they could possibly have together with my fiance and her three daughters. We had such a promising and exciting future together as one big happy family. Yet our family didn't grow as I expected. I'm sorry. As it became more and more difficult to all live together, I terribly failed my boys instead of providing them with unconditional love, support, and a home that was safe, comfortable, and nurturing. My actions were neglectful and abusive to my boys, resulting in the tragic death of Thomas. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost focus on how to be a good father. Instead of simply leaving Angela and bringing my boys out of that house, I stayed thinking I could make it work. I was so wrong. Mr. Khan and I did not want my son to die. I never imagined he would have died. However, I lost my way and convinced myself that punishments were temporary and eventually would get us back to normal. I was so wrong, it cost Thomas his life. I am so sorry, for Thomas. <clears throat> and everybody involved in this case. I apologize to all the teachers at East Mauritius School District, the CPS workers, and all persons negatively impacted by my actions. I am also deeply sorry to Houston, and she also lost a son. Despite our differences, I recognize her loss and her everlasting grief. <sighs> Your Honor, I accept your sentence, as I already sentenced myself to a lifetime filled with extreme regret, remorse, and grief. And finally, I'd like to thank my lawyers for all their tireless efforts and help on my behalf. John Leturco, Anthony Lapinta, and Sabato Capone. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Valva. Everybody who took part in this trial lost sleep, didn't eat, had nightmares. It, it was difficult for everyone. One question still beguiles me, though. <clears throat> How
how did all of us, as a community, allow this to happen? And I acknowledge this is not the appropriate forum to have that discussion, but it, it needs to happen. And in saying that, I am in no way impugning the good uh, teachers and administrators at East Mariches. Anybody who watched this trial knows that the tears that flowed from that witness stand were genuine. Those uh, teachers and administrators cared. They certainly tried. I appreciate your, and I think you are sincere in saying that you're sorry, Mr. Valva. I really do. And I don't think you intended to kill Thomas, not at all. In fact, you were not charged with intentionally killing him. But there's no getting around the fact that Thomas and lived their young lives under constant duress in the place where they should have felt safest, their own home. I'm going to quote from the pre-sentence report, quote, the events that eventually led to the victim's death were the result of a culmination of decisions and behaviors over an extended period of time. Despite being made aware of his children's declining conditions, the defendant persisted in his abusive ways. Rather than be his children's protector, he was a warden who starved and abusively punished them. And when one considers that Mr. Valva had a career as a New York City police officer, it makes your actions that much more unimaginable to be candid. An eight-year-old boy who right now should be getting excited for Christmas is dead. I speak to everybody out there. We can never let this happen again. And that's all I'll say from this bench. <clears throat> Consistent with the recommendation of the probation department, the court hereby sentences the defendant to an indeterminate sentence, the minimum being 25 years, the maximum being the remainder of his natural life. That's on count one of murder two. With respect to the uh, endangering counts two through five, defendant is sentenced to one year in the Suffolk County Jail on each of those counts, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware by operation of law. Those sentences merge with the sentence under the top count. Defendant is to be given credit for time already served. On March 10th of 2023, a jury found Angela Polina guilty of the murder of Thomas Falva. She was also found guilty of four counts of endangering the welfare of a child and one count of second-degree murder. On April 11th of 2023, Angela Polina was also sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Uh, Ms. Polina, is there anything you wish to say before I pronounce the sentence? No, Your Honor. No? No. Yeah. All right. Um, Ms. Polina, like most people in this county, I was aware of this case from the trial of that spineless, <coughs> poor excuse of a man ex fiance of yours. But it wasn't until I heard and saw what you said and did in this trial that I think we all realized how evil you really are and really were. And evil is not the word that I came up with. That's the word that you came up with to describe yourself, to describe the treatment of what you did to those poor little innocent boys. 
you, you, you tortured those boys. You tortured them. I looked up the definition of torture in the dictionary. You know what torture means? Something that causes anger or pain. The infliction of intense pain to punish, coerce, or afford sadistic pleasure. That's what you did. And never once, as Miss Kelly said, never once have you ever shown any sorrow or compassion for what happened to those little boys. I've had the opportunity to visit the prison where you will be sent. It's where all females in the state of New York go. My only regret, Ms. Paulina, is they don't have a garage there with no heat and no mattress and no blankets and no pillows. And what was it, Ms. Kelly? Nothing that belongs in a bedroom. So where you could sleep the rest of your life, because that's where you deserve to be for the rest of your natural life. Ms. Paulina, as a result of you being convicted of murder in the second degree, under count one, it's a sense of the court that you serve an indeterminate term of imprisonment with a maximum of your natural life and a minimum of 25 years. As a result of your being found guilty of count two, it's a sense of the court that you serve one year. As a result of your being found guilty of count three, it's a sense of the court that you serve one year. As a result of your being found guilty of count four, it's a sense of the court that you serve one year. And finally, as a result of your being found guilty of count five, it's a sense of court that you serve one year. Those sentences to run concurrent with each other. This entire case is extremely heartbreaking, obviously. But the part that I find the most heartbreaking is that no one would help the biological mother of these boys. Justina Zubko-Valva tried everything she could to try to help her boys, but no one would listen to her. Even after CPS, the police, and judges wouldn't listen to her, she even attempted to take to Twitter and express her concerns there. She began posting on Twitter as early as January of 2018 with the concerns of the safety of her boys, and this was two years before her son was murdered by his father. Her first tweet dated January 7th of 2018, saying, My children are punished by their father and his girlfriend to express their loving feelings towards their mommy. The next tweet on the same day saying, My children are being harmed and abused for a very long time by their father and his girlfriend, but nobody wants to help them. I was a Daddy. Daddy's house. You weren't. We just had a pee-pee accident. That's not a being bad boy. But mommy, what baby? Daddy was rude. Daddy put us at me. What happened? And then, and then he didn't want me to have breakfast and anything. Didn't want you to have breakfast? No. And Joe, were you hungry? That's okay. On January 8th of 2018, father and his girlfriend are brainwashing my special needs children and teaching them hatred towards their mommy. Parental alienation equals child abuse. My children have a right to love their mommy. Taking away that right is a crime. Another tweet on the same day. Father, his girlfriend, and her daughters are brainwashing my little children to erase me from their lives. My children are forbidden to love their mommy. My son finally gave up and started to repeat taught by his father and the girlfriend hatred towards his mommy. This is extremely horrible because both of them are using the fact that my kids are easy targets to abuse because they have special needs. Father is teaching my children hatred towards their mommy. He rather brainwash my kids than provide water to my son who is very thirsty. Who do you love? Dad and Angela. Who do you want to stay with? Dad and Angela. Who do you miss? Dad and Angela. Who do you want to live with? Dad and Angela. Mommy is mean. Mommy is mean. Mommy hits me. Mommy hits me. Mommy don't touch me. Mommy don't touch me. I love Angela. I love Angela. I love Daddy. I love Daddy. Yo, Daddy, I love you. I love you. Thank you. I want some more water. I want some more water. Thirsty. I know. Daddy, 
got you. Thank you. Got water, Daddy. I've got you some water. On January 9th of 2018, she posted, This video was made after I picked up my children for visitations from their father's house. My son, four years old, is terrified and talks about being punished by the father and his girlfriend for coming to mommy. My children are taught enormous hatred towards me by their father, his girlfriend, and her daughters. On January 18th of 2018, she posted, Please help me and my three children, whom two of them have autism, receive justice because I am extremely abused and discriminated because I come from another country, Polska. Please help my story get public because my rights to defend myself and my children got taken away from me. Cop father forbids the children from coming to their mommy by painfully squeezing their hands and making them cry in order to prove that children do not want to come to their mommy. The father of my kids is a cop who is allowed to abuse his children. <laughs> go cookie cops. Go 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 baby. Hi baby. Hi. Let him go. Hi and let them go. They can come to me. Let him go. Let him go. He wants to come here. Let him go. What are you doing to them? Every single come here, baby. I got you. I got you. I got you. I'll be back. No, he's not crying that he's going to be back. He's crying that you're shooting them. Okay, I got you. Quickly, let's go. Let's go, Tommy. Let's go. Okay. On November 22nd of 2018, she wrote, I don't even know if my children are still alive at this point. Please pray for my family and share this post with everyone to go viral and help my children receive justice that they deserve. The Child Protective Services and the court are protecting the abusers of my children and swipe everything under the rug. I am heartbroken because my children are being purposely hidden from me, and unlawfully I am not being allowed to even see my children on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Wish, praying to receive justice for my three little children who are being severely abused mentally and physically by their father and his woman. My children cannot receive any protection, help, or justice. The case of Thomas Falva is another heartbreaking case of CPS absolutely failing to protect the children they are supposed to help. Thomas's biological mother attempted to get help for her children for years, but no one would listen to her. An NYPD cop was able to abuse his son in some of the worst ways and was somehow able to avoid every single CPS report that was ever made against him. Nothing about this case will ever make any sense to me. I don't care what occupation the person the complaint is for has, if they are a judge, if they are a police officer, if they're the president of the United States. If there are several complaints from a school stating that a child is so starving that he's licking crumbs off of the floor, why is that not being investigated? If there are several different reports of children having bruises or abrasions on their bodies, why is that not being investigated? When there is over 15 reports of both of those combined, why were those not investigated? I will truly just... I'll never understand this. I remember discovering this case back in June of 2020 when the 911 call was actually revealed, and this case has stuck with me ever since then. I think about it almost every single day. It's always horrible trying to cover these cases. But there's something about listening to this case and knowing that the biological mother knew this was all happening and was hopeless. There was nothing she could do about it. It breaks every single piece of my heart. I hate that Thomas and A had to suffer. And I really hate that A had to watch his brother die. I want to take a moment before I end this video to send my sincerest condolences to any loved ones of Thomas Falva. He obviously left behind siblings and a mother that loved him very much, and I am just sending you all so much love and healing out into the universe. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the teachers, the principal, and the doctors that really tried so hard to help these boys. In cases like this, their hands are tied and they genuinely did everything they could to help Thomas. Each and every one of you are absolute saints, and I really want to send my sincerest condolences to all of you as well. 
As a mother of a beautiful, creative, and smart autistic child, this case makes every single ounce of me ache for Thomas and his mother. Any parent of autistic children know that one of our biggest worries is our children being treated differently than anyone else for the simple fact that their brain works a little bit differently. Autistic children, and really any children for that matter, need their parents to help navigate them through this crazy world, and instead, Thomas and A were treated like garbage by their father. Thomas did have a wonderful mother who clearly loved him and his brother so much, and at the very least, I'm so glad that he was able to feel safe with her, even if it was just for a small amount of time. If you have made it to this part of the video, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to Thomas's entire story. I truly appreciate all of you guys being here, and if you have a moment, please leave a comment below on your thoughts on this case. I absolutely love hearing from you guys, and I love interacting with you as much as I can. So that's all I have for you guys right now. Thank you again so much for watching, and I will see you next time.